Sloth. That's really the only viable greeting for a review of this caliber. You guys get my point. Let's just get to the... <coughs> The Goonies was released in theaters 35 years ago in June of 1985. It was directed by Richard Donner, written by Chris Columbus with a story by Steven Spielberg, and it stars a bunch of people. This is the story about a band of adventurous misfit kids known as the Goonies who live in Astoria, Oregon. That's a unique location. They take on a miserly property development company which plans to evict them from their homes so they can demolish those houses to make way for a country club. But the day before the foreclosure, these kids discover an old pirate map while they're digging around in the attic of their leader's house. This map, of course, belonging to local swashbuckling legend, One-Eyed Willie. Mikey Walsh, their leader, sees an opportunity to allow them to keep their homes. So these kids go on one final goony adventure and follow the pirate map into an underground cavern while they dodge plenty of dangerous obstacles, Home Alone-esque booby traps, and the Fratelli criminal family in order to reach the buried treasure. Just explaining this plot to you guys makes me want to watch the movie right now, again, honestly. This is one of my favorite movies, and there are so many people in my life that have never seen it before, and I always give them grief about it. I always make an effort to make sure that they watch The Goonies at least once. So if you've never seen this movie before, I love you all, you know who you are, please watch this. I can't exactly remember the first time I saw The Goonies. If I had to guess, I must have been around seven or eight years old. And ever since I watched it that first time, this is a movie that I don't even know how many times I watched it. This was on repeat all the time. Why? Because it's so much fun. And it is a constant reminder and a perfect example of why I love this art so much. It's because of the fun involved in it. This film is truly a product of love for storytelling for families of all ages. And just a heads up guys, this review will in fact contain spoilers. I'm going to get in depth about the Goonies. I'll be nice. If you've never seen it, stop the video right here. Go watch it, then come right back, and we'll go ahead and talk a little more about it. I mean, obviously, I can't recommend this movie enough. Just watch it. Watch it. All jokes aside, even when more closely examining this film, I was shocked to discover that this only has a 75% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's a pretty good score in itself. It's enough for Certified Fresh, but I feel like this should be much higher of a rating. A higher rating to equal the high stakes. Everything is on the line for these kids. Everything. The sense of urgency that the Goonies has just feels so real because for these kids, if they don't accomplish their goal, the prospect of them being moved all over to different parts of the country and being split up, that's a very real possibility. And it looms over everybody's heads in this film. Everything just feels insanely urgent. And that's another thing. The sense of urgency makes this a very fast-paced film and a very easy film to sit through. It, no joke, flies by. And this tone is established through quite possibly my favorite first act of a film ever. In my opinion, this first act is cinematic perfection. This film opens up with an extremely fun police chase sequence as the Fratelli matriarch and her son Francis attempts to break his brother Jake out of the local jailhouse. And they were like chasing this four wheel deal to real neat ORV. And there were like bullets flying all over the place. It's the most amazing thing I ever saw. Chunk, yeah, we'll get to him later. And you'll notice that as the police chase continues on in the background, we are introduced to every single main character shown a brief little tidbit of their personalities. And this whole sequence and the entire film is so seamlessly edited and masterfully directed by Richard Donner. I'll get in depth about the Goonies, I don't care. For Richard Donner, working with these kids, I can only imagine, must have been an absolute blast. The way these scenes were choreographed, where he was placing his actors, there was so much going on on many, many scenes in this film, and it's all so seamless. So the opening chase sequence finally comes to an end, and we are finally introduced to the leader of the Goonies, Mikey Walsh, played by Sean Astin. And I'm just gonna come out and say it, this right here is one of the best child performances 
ever. His passion and his energy in this role is so infectious. Once he realizes the potential of this adventure, you guys remember that whole monologue where he's recalling the legend of One-Eyed Willie, that whole sequence in the attic is such an excellent reversal for his character. Because if you remember, he was opposed to the idea of going up to the attic. It's really great acting, and I don't hear enough people talking about how great this performance was. Don't say that! Never say that! Goonies never say die! When Mikey talks, you just want to listen to him inspire you for days. And we are also soon after introduced to his older brother Brand, played by Josh Brolin, who later on in his life would become Thanos in the MCU. This movie gives you a teenage Thanos. What's not to like? All jokes aside, my interpretation of Brand watching this now, he comes off very macho whenever he's around Mikey and his friends. But in reality, Brand is very insecure and he's not overly confident in himself. You see him working out so much, it's not necessarily to impress his girlfriend, Andy. Not like he needed to anyway, the more I think about it. But that macho bravado that he carries around whenever he's around the younger members of the group. I feel like that's just a giant mask in order to hide his own insecurities about himself. This is a really fascinating arc and a really fascinating character. I think Josh Brolin did a wonderful job with this role. How about Andy and Steph, played by Carrie Green and Martha Plinton, respectively? Both very strong female presences. Steph's role being the voice of reason of the group, and Andy, of course, being the pretty girlfriend of Brand. And I think both actresses play their roles extremely well. I think their presences are extremely important, mostly to help these kids think more realistically and not just to act on their own instincts. This is ridiculous. It's like I'm babysitting, except I'm not getting paid. Yeah, can you tell how quotable this movie is? But jokes aside, this character trait is most prevalent in one of my favorite scenes in the film, Inside the Wishing Well. Such a sense of euphoria once they enter the wishing well and see all those coins. And the kids on instinct immediately think that they've hit the jackpot and they have enough to pay off the foreclosure. And they're not exactly thinking about the pirate ship at this point and the possibility that the modern currency here does not equate to the map. That's what the older presences are there for, to correct them. These are somebody else's wishes. There's somebody else's dreams. Even though the dreams that this film talks about definitely feel super lofty, the film has a way of grounding us into a more realistic way of thinking. But at the same time, the film also has a way of making these dreams feel possible and real and achievable goals. Because it's their time. Their time up there. Down here, it's our time. I love Mikey. I love this movie. As much as I love him, though, I don't even necessarily think he's my favorite of the group. That distinction, I think, belongs to Mouth, played by Corey Feldman. Now, growing up, Corey Feldman was honestly one of my favorite actors, not just in this, but also in Stand By Me, which would be released a year after this. Now, one thing about Mouth as a character is he is 100% confident in himself, to his detriment sometimes. A lot of the time, the sh that he says gets him and the rest of the gang into trouble a lot of the time, hence the name Mouth. His cleverness and his smugness shines through. His arrogance never becomes insufferable. He's actually quite charming and quite likable here. One other thing to note is that he is the translator of the pirate map, which is mostly written in Spanish. And this character trait is established in a great scene when he tricks the maid that Mikey's mom hires to clean up the house before the demolition. He tricks her into thinking that she signed up for the wrong gig. He's talking to her about the non-existent drugs in the bedroom dresser and how the attic keeps the father's non-existent sexual torture devices. It's a great scene. That's another thing about this film. This is so freaking funny. A lot of the banter is just comedy gold. The slapstick throughout this film. Awesome. Now, if you thought Mouth had sass, Wait until you watch Data, played by Jonathan Ki Huey Kwan. Now, I'm sure most of you might remember this actor most for his role as Short Round in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. But for me growing up, he was always Data to me, and I feel like he'll be Data forever. Now, one thing I will say is this is a very, very smart, very clever character. Probably the smartest in the entire group, in all honesty. He's an inventor. He has all these crazy gadgets like bully blinders and slick shoes and pinchers of peril, which are pretty much just false teeth that save him from falling or biting Joe Mangan yellow in the place you don't want to be bitten. Data is such a fun character. He's very polite, probably the nicest in the entire 
entire group. But like I said, if you guys thought Mouth had sass, these characters throw so many quips at each other. They trade snaps all the time, throwing insults at one another. As many insults as Data gets to this film, he takes a lot of them, but man, can he dish that stuff back. That's one thing that I always feel is so underestimated about Data is how funny he is. Such a great presence. Now there's one more member of the gang that I need to talk about, and that's Chunk, played by Jeff Cohen. Now this is Jeff Cohen's most iconic role. He's mostly known as being a Hollywood producer nowadays, but his performance is so fun. Chunk was always a crowd pleaser, especially when I was growing up. You do not want to see me do the truffle shuffle because I can't and I absolutely won't. Now I'm gonna go on a little tangent here. The movie sells Chunk as somebody that loves to eat, right? And it also kind of tells us how dumb they think Chunk is through all the bullshit stories that he tells the police, for instance. But I'm just gonna go on record saying this. I think Chunk is a lot smarter than the movie gives him credit for. The perfect example of this is when the Fratellis do capture him and they threaten him with a blender by trying to put his hand down there and hit puree. He tells them every single thing he does wrong in his own life instead of telling them all the details about what Mikey and his friends are doing. He's buying time. The kid's actually quite clever. One more thing about Chunk is his relationship with Sloth, played by late great NFL player John Matusak. That relationship is one of the most endearing, touching, and funny and weird relationships that you could ever put to the screen. It's absolutely wonderful, don't get me wrong. And I will also say that John Matusak looked like he was having the time of his life. Now Sloth is actually mentioned as the third Fratelli brother, but he's not a villain. The three villains in this movie, the mother and Jake and Francis, yeah, those are their two names, right? All three of them, excellent, excellent performances. Anne Ramsey, may she rest in peace, is a great matriarch. Robert Davi, who is classic classically trained as a singer and he shows it in this role. I think it's a pretty nice and funny little touch. He's very menacing. Joe Manganiello as Francis wears a hairpiece. Very, very fun performance. And those two guys took a freaking beating in this movie. Wow. And as the film builds and builds and we get deeper and deeper down into the cavern, these set pieces are just so, so incredible. It is a absolutely beautiful looking film. Gorgeous, gorgeous location shots on the beach. The cinematography is absolutely wonderful. And I will say that all of the booby trap sequences in this film are very, very intense. It's not like you're watching a Home Alone where it's just all slapstick. There's a lot on the line once again. And no no booby trap scene feels more intense than the organ of bones that Andy, who had only taken piano lessons as a toddler, she has to play the organ of bones in order to get them out of their life. It's a very, very intense scene. Now, I will say that some people might look at this film and try to nitpick all the plot holes. For example, that same trap I was talking about, how the Fratellis found their way out of it. I honestly don't think that's too much of an issue because the Fratellis are all grown-ups. They can find loopholes out of these situations. Now that organ of bone scene leads to probably one of the most fun climaxes I can remember. I always wanted to go down that giant water slide as a kid. I still kind of do now thinking about it. But the kids all reach the bottom of the water slide into a shallow pool of water and that's where they see the beautiful inferno pirate ship of one-eyed willy now i read somewhere that their their reactions on camera were actually the first time that they had ever seen the pirate ship on set i don't know how 100 percent accurate that is but nevertheless those reactions were so genuine those kids were all such wonderful actors and they still are today but such such raw emotion here. And the emotion was definitely there when Mikey finally does encounter the skeleton of One-Eyed Willie. And that conversation that he has with the skeleton is just... Oh, gosh, guys. And then when the Fratellis finally do encounter them on the pirate ship, they make them walk the plank after Andy insults one of them. Sloth and Chunk come in to save the day. Super Sloth for the win. The ending of this film just felt so, so satisfying in every possible way. And when they actually do encounter a set of jewels in Mikey's marble bag, which the Fratellis forgot to check when they frisked them. Oh, 
God, such an incredible ending to a truly incredible film. As you can tell, I obviously can't recommend this film enough. The Goonies is one of my favorite films ever. It's required viewing for me at least once a year. It never gets old. It never will. I love this film with a passion, and I think it absolutely deserves my highest grade of an A+. <laughs> yes. It is very possible for you to sit there and consider all the plot holes that this film has and nitpick the film for all it's worth. But honestly, with a story this outlandish and this fun, and everybody was throwing their f***ing all into it, I really don't feel the need to nitpick all the plot holes here. This is a nostalgic movie for me in so many ways. Like I said, It'll never get old. I definitely recommend this film 100%, guys. Well, guys, thank you all so much for tuning in as always. If you like what you saw today, don't forget to hit that thumbs up button down below. Let me know in the comments what you guys thought of The Goonies and also any other requests you guys would like to see me review on this channel. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below as hard as you possibly can. You guys rock. Thank you so much for tuning in once again. And with all that being said, back talk, commence.